gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very grateful for the opportunity that you give us to come together and feast upon your word, to labor, to work without growing weary in your word so that we may grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. I ask that you would filter out any foolishness but seal to our hearts that which is truth and only truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're going to continue on in our study in the second epistle to the Thessalonians. We've uh, come to chapter 3. And so I'm going to try to cover quite a bit of territory. Uh, not that I'm in, in any hurry here. It's just that the subject matter that I, I'm going to talk about in this video requires that I do that. I don't know how many times I have prayed that for you folks constantly that that you would that the Lord would grant you the grace to grow in grace and knowledge of him through his word this book how many times I've placed such a heavy emphasis on the importance of Bible study. In fact, it marks this channel. It a serious study of the scriptures is what defines blessed hope forever. It's important, dearly beloved, listen to me. I, I know that some of you may feel that it's redundant that I talk about how important it is that we spend time in this book. Okay, I think that what we're going to see, if you'll hang with me here throughout this video, uh, uh, part seven, I think what you're going to see is you're going to see something in the text that you may not have uh, noticed before. Now, in order to do this, and I, I have really looked forward to coming to this chapter to talk about this and maybe by the end of the video you'll you'll better understand why i want to begin not with verse one of chapter three i, I want to begin this by by asking you to turn to john chapter four where we read starting at verse 31 Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples were saying to one another, No one brought him anything to eat. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work accomplish his work many of you are familiar with the words what may we do to uh, to do the works of God and Jesus said believe in him whom God has sent in the sixth chapter of John Jesus replied, Truly, truly, I tell you, it is not because you saw these signs that you are looking for me. He's speaking to those who were present at the feeding of the 5,000. But because you ate the loaves and had your fill. They were, if you look closely at the text, folks, you'll find out that there were those who were only content with what God would provide physically and <coughs> excuse
excuse me. We read there in John 6, do not work for food that perishes, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. The sense there is work not out. Let it not be the result of your constant working to have food. It's not uh, uh, the text there is not saying, you know, when you where we read, do not work for food that perishes. Well, of course, we have to work to go to the supermarket and buy food to keep our body alive. That's it's not saying don't it's do not work for food that perishes. Well, we have to work for food that, that perishes. What the text is saying is. But we work for food that endures to eternal life. The, the emphasis, the importance is placed on that which is spiritual above that which, which is physical. Of course, both are necessary. But the point I'm trying to, to, to bring out here is, as the text says, food which perishes, but let your work be one worthy of your endeavor, food which endures unto eternal life, which, which food the Son of Man will give to you. If you turn to Acts chapter 2, you'll, you'll read, And all that believed were together, and they had all things in common. This was, with the, we're looking at the beginning of the church here, the early, the primitive church. And they sold their possessions and their goods, and they parted, parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. And that's a whole entire video in and of itself. The Lord added, don't miss don't miss what the text is saying, folks. I know this is kind of jumping, uh, I'm jumping off into a different subject here. But the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. I've, I've done a number of videos that, that really, I believe, that, that bring a lot of clarity to that point. You know, concerning the gospel, evangelism, what it is we preach, who we preach, and so on and so forth. But that's not the, the subject of this video. The subject of this video in our present context and what I want to spend some time talking with you about is of enormous importance. In fact, it, like I said, I've, been, I've waited a long time to get to the third chapter here to bring out of the text what I believe, what the text, what we will be seeing in the text as we go through this text. And many of you will be surprised at what I, I believe the Holy Spirit, the thought that the Holy Spirit intended to convey to us through this present text that has to do with feasting upon God's Word. Acts chapter 4. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that, that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked for as many as were Possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet. No, I'm not asking you people to do that for this ministry. Uh, so distribution was made unto every man according to as, as he had need. 
If you read on through the text, here, what you will see is that the early church, this was how the church then, at that time, supplied the needs of the saints. Of course, that's changed over time. Today, it's, you know, you, you go to church, they, they take up an offering, uh, they go about it in a different means, but it's, it's basically the same principle. Now, when we come to our present study here, verse 1, uh, I'd like to, to, to draw your attention to the first five verses of chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified, even as it is with you. The question I'm going to ask you folks is, this: it's a simple question. How would the word of the Lord have free course? I don't believe that we can separate that thought, that idea from an understanding of the Word. Right from the beginning of the chapter, we see just the Word of the Lord, those, those, those very few words there, the Word of the Lord that may have free course. You see that that phrase, that emphasis on God's Word as pushing everything that else that we're going to look at forward. And that we may be delivered from unreasonable and, un and wicked men. Unreasonable and wicked. Some are wicked, but some are just unreasonable. For all men have not faith. We know faith comes through the Word. But the Lord is faithful. And I don't know how many times I've pointed out that, that you know, God, and, you know, God is faithful in our lives. Faithful is, is the Lord who also will do what He said that He will do. It's not our, neither our our eternal destiny, our eternal destiny is not, if it was, if it was, if it depended upon your faith or my faith, folks, okay, if, if, if heaven, if, if our eternal destiny depended upon our faithfulness to, to be, to remain faithful, we'd be in trouble. But God is faithful. Always faithful. Why is He always faithful? Why can He be always trusted? Why is He trustworthy? Because He, he will do what He said that He would do. And how did He go about saying what He would do? Well, it was, it was either the spoken or the written word. Again, we see an emphasis on the Word. The Lord is faithful who shall establish, that is, strengthen you and keep you from evil. And we have confidence in the Lord touching you, Paul says, that you both do and will do the things which we command you. And the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God, the love of God, not your love for Him, the love of God. And folks, that's only known through diligent study. And into the patient, underline the word patient, folks. This is, this is, uh, that's, this, this is the, uh, of, th these are words here that many, t I know there's so many Christians alive today or so, who are so anxious for the Lord to appear, and yet we're reading in the text the patient waiting for Christ. God's timing, 
God's faithfulness, His perfect timing, the patient waiting for Christ. If you followed through these studies, you know that, and, and I hope that you, you have seen where I've pointed out that the problem that these that many of these believers at Thessalonica, one of the problems that they had was that they, they wrongly believed that they were in the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord had arrived. They were in that time of that period of persecution and suffering in which the Lord was soon to return. And, uh, I don't want to get ahead of myself here, but and I could probably do better with this video just by just speaking to you folks mainly from the heart concerning the text that we're looking at. Many of these, there's no doubt in my mind that many of these believers had basically given up working believing that the Lord's return was near. And what I hope that you'll see in the text is both aspects of, of the, the physical aspect as well as the spiritual aspect of working for nourishment. So I'm really going to concentrate heavily on verses 6 through 15 which I believe is the main thrust of, of the message that, that I hope to bring out in this video. I'll pause here for just a moment to thank you all for your continued interest in this, min in this ministry. Lives are being changed. And the reason why that they're being changed is because it's not because of me but it's because God fa is faithful to His Word and there is nothing better, folks, that, that we can do, that any of us can do at the present time, given our present circumstances, no matter what those circumstances are, there is nothing better than, that we could do then spend time in this book. Above all else, and not be, not be, not slack, be slackful, not be lazy, not believe that just because the Lord is returning soon, that, well, we don't, we don't need to work. Whether, whether it's a physical job, well, we can just rely on the church to meet our needs. Or we don't really have to feast upon His Word. Now, you know, He's coming soon, so, hey, you know, why? All, all this stuff about study and, I mean, and study is hard. It's hard work, folks. You, we grow weary from studying only, only. Because we are told not to grow weary, okay? You'll see in the text, we're told not to grow weary. I, I'm convinced that the only way that, we, that anyone, any Christian would grow weary from, from doing good, that is studying His Word, feasting on His Word. That is, that is the good the text, I believe, is talking about. is as if you know to look at bible study folks is just oh my gosh that's just such an awful chore you know it's there's so many christians i know that are out there today who would who he just just the thought the mere thought of laboring intensively over god's word is just, I mean, it's a dreadful thought. You know, that's just, I mean, because, gosh, that's so boring. 
because basically all I'm going to see anyway, all I'm look, you know, by doing so, I'm just looking at, you know, I'm, 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 I'm allowing God to pile even more stuff on, on my shoulders to do more of a burden to bear. You know, I'm already pretty much beaten down, you know, halfway destroyed. I mean, I, I don't want to, but, or maybe I don't know how to study. The, the, the excitement is not there because I'm just looking at a book, a lit, uh, this is just a, a book of instructions on how to live the Christian life, kind of like a computer manual. You know, I have over here on how to operate my computer. It's boring. It's dry. And the only reason that any Christian would say that or think that is because they miss seeing Jesus in the Word. They, they go to the Word and, and for the most part, they're, they're looking in a mirror and they're seeing themselves. Are, are, listen, folks, dearly beloved, this book is not a book of instructions on how to live the Christian life. It is primarily a revelation of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. We come to His Word to feast on Christ. When you hear me talking about feasting on His Word, we're feasting on Christ. I hope, I hope you'll see that more clearly as we get closer to the end of this. Starting at verse 6, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, stop. I think we need to take this serious. Okay, what, what we're about to, to hear Paul say, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walks disorderly and not after the tradition which you received of us. For yourselves know how you ought to follow us, for we behaved not ourselves disorderly among you, neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day that we might not be chargeable to any of you. And folks, there is not a single one of you out there that would not agree. Not a single one. that if we don't work, we don't eat. Now, of course, I understand that there are soup kitchens and there are, you know, food stamps and there are charities and organizations, and even churches that contribute to the needs of the saints. I understand that you can, you can be fed and, and not work. I understand that. That's not the point I'm trying to make here. If any would not work, neither should he eat. Let me just go on with the text. Verse 11, For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him that he may be ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Given the context, folks, of these believers at Thessalonica, there were likely those who didn't want to work thinking that the day of the Lord had arrived. And there were likely those who were, well, there were, there's probably little, I mean, there's little doubt that there were probably those there who were also just plain lazy and thought that they could depend upon the generosity of the church to support them. The early church, folks, this, this is what we saw in Acts. This is what the church did. But the early church really was, they resisted that idea. And telling them to return to their occupations. The spirit of, of the early church and the readiness of, of, its, of its members to direct their goods toward the common 
service. As stated in, 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 in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4, were, it was abused, folks, by idlers. Idlers. It was abused. Many thought they'd found a, a, a great thing. I mean, oh gosh, now I don't have to make uh, chariot wheels, you know, or I don't have to, to haul water or dig wells or whatever the case might have been. I don't have to do that anymore. I found a great thing here with, you know, this new, this new newfangled religion called Christianity. You know, they're going to meet all my needs. I don't have to work. I believe that there is a spiritual lesson to be found here in this as well in the sense of our laboring, our feasting upon God's Word. That if we don't spend time in the Word, we will not eat of, we will not feast upon the bread of life. spiritually idle, depending solely upon others to meet our spiritual needs, which in my opinion describes the majority of Christians, sadly, I, that describes the majority of Christians today who solely rely on the opinions of others, rarely spending any real time in this book. Uh, they're just satisfied with what their, their pastor has to say. I've actually had people say to me, you know, there was a lady years ago that said, I don't know, Steve, about what you're saying. I don't know. I, I'm going to have to ask my pastor about that. I don't know how many times I've said, don't believe something, folks, just because I believe it. Folks, spend time in this book. Now, I want you to know that the Philippians, they did not consider it a burden to contribute to Paul's support. Okay? That's clear. Just, you know, from in Philippians chapter 4, sending him support even while he was in Thessalonica. Okay? And as you Philippians know, in the early days of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church but you partnered with me in the matter of giving and receiving. For even while I was in Thessalonica, you provided for my needs again and again, says Paul. Yes, pastors should be supported, church Churches should be supported. I'll touch a little more on that as we go through this, but, you know, many of the Thessalonians would have felt it, you know, felt honored, felt, felt that it was a privilege to contribute. But, When Paul saw that there were these idlers among them, which he obviously did, he waived his right to support. Paul's example, though he had, a, he had the right to be supported, was to show the disgrace of living without any effort at the cost of others. Delivering the gospel, folks, is priority above all else. All else. I think, personally, I think it's more important than breathing. But, you know, supporting the ministry is biblical. The elders who who direct the affairs of the church 
are worthy of double honor, especially those who work in preaching and teaching. That's what the text says. That's what this book says. Do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain and the worker deserves his wages and <clears throat> so on and so forth. First, to, first Timothy, you know, those who faithfully minister the Word of God should receive compensation for their work. First Corinthians chapter 9. Paul says, if we sowed spiritual things in you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? Says, said Paul, I mean, the same apostle, okay? So, what is he talking about here? And, and what can we gain from all of this? What is, the, what is the thought, the main thought that the Holy Spirit is trying to convey here through this passage in the third chapter of 2 Thessalonians? Those who work, those who labor, whether it is whether it's for physical or spiritual food, eat. They eat. They have a right to eat. Those who do not labor for their food, if they do eat, their eating can be can become burdensome to others. It's in this sense that we prefer not to become a burden to others. I don't believe those that Paul was talking about cared one way or another whether they were a burden to others. And it was in this that Paul sought to become an example. These verses really now come up across more clearly. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you, that's that was that was Paul's concern as far as their praying for him, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. For all men have not faith, but the Lord is faithful, who shall strengthen you and keep you from evil. And we have confidence in the Lord touching you that you both do and will do the things which we command you. And the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. In verses 10 through 15, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. If you turn to John chapter six let's do that turn turn to john chapter six this the same chapter as the feeding of the five thousand and what do we read john chapter six verse 53 we're looking at the same chapter here john chapter six as same chapter as the feeding of the five thousand Verse 53, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat, eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, ye have no life in you. This book, dearly beloved, is the revelation of Jesus Christ, and you won't know that unless you really study it. So behind this physical illustration of working to eat, and not giving up because we think the, the Lord's return is near, is our feasting spiritually. We need to apply ourselves and work diligently in our spiritual nourishment. Just as we have to labor physically, we've got to do it spiritually. If any man does not give diligence to the Word of God, he's not going to eat. Folks, this is true both spiritually and and physically. These are, are busy bodies who meddle in the work of others. If they're not working physically, they're like well, they're likely not working spiritually. 
eating one's own bread. I believe that, folks, to be both spirit, physical as well as spiritual. It is God who exhorts you in our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, Israel had manna in the wilderness. But Jesus was the bread of life that came down out of heaven. Verse 13, ye brethren are not to become weary of doing that which is right. Of, don't become weary of doing that which is right. Feasting on Christ, the bread of life. How could you become weary of that? If you're, if you're in your study, in your diligent study of God's Word, you're seeing Christ and not just yourself. Galatians 6, 9. And let us not be weary in well-doing. Same thing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Okay? Weary, faint, same Greek word in the Greek. Verse 14, and if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him that he may be ashamed. Okay, ashamed. Ashamed, folks, okay? Ashamed. Where have you heard that word before? We are to study, to show ourselves approved, a workman that needeth not be ashamed. You know, folks, I'll, I admit, uh, I, I'll admit, I, I find it difficult to have company with somebody who has clearly shown no interest whatsoever in spending time in this book. And here my, my text is, is telling me not to have company with such ones. You know, those who would only chase after me for some fish and a loaf of bread, you know. Uh, those who just want to be spoon-fed, you know, which is far different from one who understands that his food, his food, like our Lord's, is to do the will of God. Or, or those who don't really care to feast upon God's Word because they figure, well, why should I? Okay, the Lord's coming soon. Hello. Which practically defines the, the, the views that these videos get. I don't mean, folks, listen, I don't mean to, to send out, put out a, a scathing indictment on, on those who are who are looking for you know toward their ha, have their eyes gazing heavenward you know they're they're anxiously awaiting the Lord and and they understand that the rapture is our blessed hope that Jesus Christ is our blessed hope and they're just so eager to go home I'm not trying by in by any means okay to throw water on their enthusiasm. What I'm trying to explain to you, folk, dear, dearly beloved, okay? Listen to me. Well, why should I study? You know, he's coming back soon, so why should I study? This is exactly what those at Thessalonica were doing, is, is what I'm trying to get you to see here. There's both a physical as well as a spiritual side of this. The same principle is true whether it's we're just speaking of eating, feasting, working, eating, work, eat, work, eat. Whether we're talking about this physically or spiritually, the same principle is true. They may be a brother 
or a sister. But there is little genuine fellowship there when it comes to doctrinal truth concerning the bread of life. Where that leaving here is about all, well, that's about all we have in common. Okay, you know? You know, it's ironic. It really is how, how the, these videos get so little interest. And here we are looking at the very text that describes the, that disinterest. But as the text says, I am to admonish him as a brother. Okay? And the word admonish means to, the word there means to reason with someone by warning them. You admonish through instruction. Okay? You're, you're supplying them doctrinal, you know, spiritual substance. You're exerting positive pressure on someone's logic or their reasoning, urging them to choose what is best for them, and that is spend time in this book. Okay? And not just, well, why labor? Why work? You know, the Lord's coming. He's... The Lord's about to return, so why spend time in this book? Or, which I, which I believe, I'm convinced that that's what many of these believers at Thessalonica was doing, but I'm sure that there were other reasons for not working and eating as well. Look, I love you all. I truly do. I thank you for your continued interest in these verse-by-verse -verse studies. We'll pick back up in chapter 3 in the next video. I hope all of you are staying safe out there. I want to thank you for all of your messages, of uh, your kind messages of comfort and encouragement. I ask for your prayers concerning the direction of this ministry. I want you all to know that I'm praying for you all constantly. Until next time. This is Steve. Thanks for watching.